Good morning. Um, I'm going to speak about posterior instability of the shoulder, uh, one of my favorite topics. So we just finished the meta-analysis study, uh, Jeff DeLong and, and my fellow and I, and uh, we found out that in, <clears throat> there was over uh, 1,124 papers in the world on posterior instability, of which 70, over 70 of them were actually pertinent to what we do. So the total number of patients uh, was, um, or shoulders was uh, 999, and the total number of athletes was 956. The important thing that we found out that he just told me is actually, of all the athletes in the literature done arthroscopically, we had 58% of them were done by our group, and we had 50% of the shoulders, and then of the total population open and arthroscopic, our group had 43% of the athletes and 45% of the shoulders. So I just want to tell you, um, about posterior instability, uh, the continuum, uh, the compendium of our studies and, and what we feel, uh, and the 10 lessons I learned over the last 18 years. I want to send my gratitude to my mentor, Frank Job, who, who just recently passed away. He was a great man. So the pathology uh, of posterior instability, there's multiple different theories, anywhere from glenoid retroversion and hypoplasia to muscular imbalances in, in throwers. Uh, my opinion is it's usually a combination of a couple of the above. First thing I learned on the etiology is the etiology in overhand athletes is frequently different than contact athletes, and, and so is the treatment. So back in uh, 1993, Jimmy Taboni and I pr presented our article on uh, athletes, and we thought what happened was there was chronic overuse, microtrauma to the posterior capsule, capsular attenuation, and posterior subluxation in a group of throwers and tennis players and swimmers. And then uh, Lee Kaplan and I did a, did a study on elite football players at the NFL Combine, and we found there was an overwhelmingly increase in, in offensive linemen compared to defensive linemen. They were the two highest groups of all of them. <clears throat> so uh, kind of the take-home message, the uh, mechanism of injury in overhand athletes is an indirect one, and the mechanism of injury in contact actually is usually a direct one. The second thing we learned, which is theoretical in throwers, so you've got to think of throwers as a completely different group of this because uh, they're really hard to deal with. Uh, is we initially thought they had a tight posterior inferior capsule or this GERD and we had repetitive microtrauma after ball release and then we had progressive tearing of the, of the posterior inferior labrum and they had mechanical symptoms or pain during follow through was the key finding and they had no instability symptoms. <clears throat> so if you look below, this is one of my pictures and you can see he just has a split in his capsule. Um, we uh, unroof it and we simply repaired the labrum, uh, no capsular plications. The second thing we learned is in, on physical exam findings that predict, predict a poor response to physical therapy. So if you have this guy with a circumduction test like this, no matter what age, <clears throat> I really can't get him better with physical therapy. They, I haven't seen many of them get better. So it, pop, it goes out the back and then he reduces himself. The next thing that worries me is this load and shift. If you put the arm in neutral and they just slide right out the back and they, and they, they stay there, <clears throat> that also is a poor prognostic factor for any type of physical therapy helping them. Uh, you want to beware of hyperlaxity states. I'm sorry, could you make that run? Uh, you want to be aware of any hyperlaxity states. Uh, our Biton classification, you got to remember those, uh, anybody that's five out of nine. If you don't know the Biton classification, you ought to, uh, you ought to look it up. Uh, we last year alone diagnosed six patients with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, just from our physical exam alone. Uh, it used to be 11 different types, and now it's down to three major and three minor types. The most common in our group were this hypermobile group, which we treat totally differently than we would uh, our normal posterior instability. The next thing you want to be careful of is bone loss. Well, how much bone loss is too much? We heard about anteriorly. Uh, the answer in the literature is we really don't know. I mean, we have no idea based on the literature we have right now. So you got to realize that if you, if you use Joe Iannotti's um, uh, measurements of the glenoid, you know, if you have a 30% deficit at only eight millimeters. So what we did was Craig Morrow and I looked at our 200 repairs that we did and published, and we found that the only predictive thing was that decreased bony width was a predictive factor of poor results. But that's nothing about bone loss. It's the width of the glenoid only. They were included. The other thing is, what about retroversion? You know, how much retroversion is too much? Well, the answer in the literature is we really don't know. So when we looked at our group, which we recently did, the increased retroversion did not predict a poor result. So if you look on, the, on the, your right, that, that's a, 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 D, a, a tight end from a major college in Ohio uh, who's a very good player who we did a posterior reconstruction on, and, and he's gone two years now with that amount of retroversion and played and went into the NFL. So the study was the effect of glenoid version and width on the outcomes of arthroscopic posterior stabilization. 
So I took the 200 patients we did prospectively out two years, and we had all of their outcomes, and, and of those 118, we had MRIs done at our institution, and we found basically that in the final, there was no significant difference in bony or chondral labral uh, outcomes. So they had large version problems. They, they just didn't, wasn't a problem after we fixed them. However, we did find that there was a significance if you had a decreased bony width of the glenoid, and that was a predictor of poor, uh, poor, poorer outcomes postoperatively. So the question I've been asking is, uh, is there a percentage of glenoid bone loss that is significant? So we're looking at it, and, and I can tell you from 121 MRIs we looked at, uh, over two-year follow-up, we have all their grading systems, um, 27 had bone loss. And we found absolutely no correlation with our bone loss patients with poor results. Now, that's in, in, in versus JT Tokish that says it should be about 13%. So we're still looking at it. We use the perfect circle but the technique, so we're looking at other techniques. And, and the argument should be is, look, MRI is not as good as CT scan. But the problem for us is we all get MRIs to evaluate our patients. We don't immediately get CT scans of everybody. So we, we can't have a normal group. We can get the bony group. We can't get the normal group. But we're working on it. I, I may give you a number next year. The interesting is the risk factors for posterior instability in young athletes, Brett Owens did a great paper on it within the military, is the most significant risk factor for posterior glenoid uh, instability is actually increased retroversion. So for every degree of increased retroversion over normal, there's a 17% increased risk of posterior shoulder instability in, in his uh, highly athletic populate, population in the military. So even though postoperatively it didn't seem to make a difference to us, preoperatively, if you have increased version, you're probably at greater risk. Um, the next thing is beware of scapular dyskinesis. I mean, Bed Kibler is the champion of this, but, and I've talked to Ben about it a lot, but I have patients that come in and their primary complaint is their scapular wings. And we go through all the, the, the normal work of it, and it ends out they have posterior instability. And what they do is they protect their shoulder from going out the back by moving their scapula to, to, to block the shoulder from going out the back. So be careful of that if you have some young people with that, that they don't really have posterior instability of their shoulder. You always want to evaluate this for scapular dyskinesis, especially in throwers, because throwers naturally are protracted. That's the way they are. If you've got a pitcher, they're protracted when you look at them. That's a normal for a pitcher. We published that study. And, they get post, and then what happens, they have posterior cuff muscles are weakened and they get inhibited. And then, the, then the, the lax posterior capsule cannot constrain the action of the latissimus as they go into internal rotation, horizontal abduction, adduction. So what happens, the, the, the pec in the front and the lat in the back have to balance when they throw. And once that happens, that they, they get poor cuff muscles and they weaken, then you get the lat just pulling it right out the back. So just look at the back. The third thing we learned is the, the, that the literature says that labral tears and retroversion are, are common and rare. That's not true. They are both bony and chondral label version are very common in posterior instability of the shoulder. So of our first 100 patients we published, we had a 57% had some form of labral lesion, which put it, you know, over half of them have some form of labral lesion right at the bat. So they are not rare, they're common. The fourth thing we learned is that posterior instability rarely comes in, in, com in isolation. It always comes in some kind of combination. So it's either with a slap, a partial cuff tear, posterior glenoid DJD, a reverse haggle lesion. So here's examples. These are all posterior instabilities of, of, of major college athletes and, and an NFL guy. So the first guy comes in and there's the split in his biceps that you're going to have to fix the bicep split, then you're going to have to fix them posteriorly. The next guy's a middle linebacker for an NFL team here in, in Florida, and uh, he had a posterior haggle. That's the way he presented uh, with his posterior instability. The next one is a major college football player who comes with that huge split in there, so you have to fix the split and then, then deal with the labrum. So be prepared to look for other pathology. So we have over 400 patients in our current prospective study group that we have operated on already, and over 40% of them have some additional pathology that's, that needs addressed. A partial cuff tear above, a, a slap type eight lesion where it goes up uh, into the top with a peel back. Um, so just be prepared, you're gonna, you're, gonna, you're gonna find it. These reverse haggle lesions, you really gotta be careful with these things because, you, because it's, the, the radiologist is not gonna read it. You're gonna read it. So here's his MRI on the left. Uh, of the, the linebacker, here's the way it looks like arthroscopically. But if you're not prepared for that ahead of time and think about it, you know, you're going to be caught by surprise and you're going to wonder what to do. I can tell you that arthroscopically this is really easy to fix. It's easier to fix than anteriors because I, I can't really fix anterior haggles that well. I have to open them. I'm not good enough to fix those, but posteriorly I can fix them. 
<clears throat> Here's an example of posterior capsular tears, which you're gonna find. There's a baseball player, there's a prior thermal, and there's a football player. So you're gonna have to fix that capsule first and then determine the amount of stability that you have or the amount that you want them to have before you do anything. The fifth thing we learned is that overhand athletes have poor results and poor outcomes and return to sports. So if you look at the literature, this is the literature, all the literature in the world uh, that, that said something about a thrower. So there were small numbers uh, and they were not well documented and most of them did not do well in these studies. So we looked at our first, we had 27 that Radkowski and I did with Champ Baker's uh, son, uh, uh, Lee. And what we found out is that uh, we had great EAS, ASES scores, but the problem is ASES score is too generous. The Curlin Job score is the way you want to go if you're going to do a thrower. All right, because it's much more onerous the, the way it comes back, or a Conway scale. So the important things were this. Three out of three of my failures were with capsular plication without suture anchors, and that 55% of those patients were less likely to return to their pre-injury level. So you have to school them on that. So then what I said was, did, did I get any better as I did more? And so of our 200 athletes, 56, 60, 56 of them were overhand athletes. And what we found out is if you took the whole group, their return to sport was 61% at the same level now, not lower. But of our non-throwers, only 65% returned to the same level, which isn't very good. But if we took the anchorless repairs out, 70% of the throwers went back to their pre-injury level. So the point again is that it, when in doubt, use suture anchors. So in the end, we found out that it, that uh, too loose is always better than too tight in our overhand athletes because if you restrict their external rotation and you drive them superiorly, they can never return their velocity. So you've just taken a major leaguer and put them in a minor league. So throwers are the hardest ones to deal with. The sixth thing we learned is that contact athletes have much better outcomes and much better return to sport. So of the entire group of 200, we had 117 contact athletes. We had 93% good to excellent results. We had really good return to sport on those. So of your football players and, and, and rugby players in our hands, well, we don't have many rugby players, but of the soccer players, they, they really did rather well. And what we found out is in the end, too tight is always a little better than too loose for the contact athletes. And I think what happens here, the throwers are so hard to balance because you don't want to ruin their external rotation and you don't want to ruin, ruin their motion. But the, the real contact athletes that don't do that, you can really tighten them up pretty good and, and be co very confident. The next thing we learned out is that, that arthroscopic treatment is definitely better than open treatment, especially in overhand athletes. So why is it better? Because it allows you to do other concomitant pathology, partial cuff tears, slap tears, capsular tears, haggles. The literature is very, uh, I mean, I don't have, I have a large one to talk, but I can tell you the literature, the recurrence rates are significantly less than the literature uh, for, uh, post, or for arthroscopic, and there's improved perioperative morbidity. So how am I doing it now? This is kind of the newer technique. We, we call it zone-specific repair, um, and it's in the upper right there, and, and I, I'm, uh, this labral tape has changed my, 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 the way I do a lot of things. It's 39% stronger, has a 37% greater pullout strength. This, this is a tissue retracting bird. I don't think we spend enough time uh, biologically getting the, the, the glenoid rasp enough. This is a paracutaneous seven o'clock portal in which I'm gonna put a two, uh, four anchor in. I, I, I'm just a little scared still of putting the, 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 the knotless down there because of the size of the portal you have to make. So this is all paracutaneous with that paracutaneous kit. Uh, use uh, these real passes. I'm telling you, these things, the, the, my nurses love these real passes. If you haven't seen them, go look at them. I mean, because they don't have to load anything, so they're very quick. And they, and they, they have like almost, you can do like almost 15 throws with them. Uh, I like Weston knots, which are sliding locking knots uh, away from the glenoid. These knots will migrate toward the glenoid. That's why we don't like to use them up superiorly. Uh, Neil Elitraj has a very good video of, the, of knot impingement when they get high and they squeak. So up high in the glenoid, above the equator, you want to stay away from uh, knots. So you put two of those in. Don't worry about that bumper because that bumper goes away. Let me tell you, I've had plenty of revisions I've seen and that bumper is not there. Um, uh, there's other things like uh, lassos you can use, but here's the labral tape. It's two millimeters, it's wide. Um, I, I, I can plicate with it now. I'm much, more, I'm much better with it than I, than I used to be. You gotta, you gotta leave a little more slack than I left there. You gotta leave a little more slack. And these, these short 2.9 anchors, they're tiny. Uh, 2.9 millimeter, 12 millimeter by 2.9s are the way to go. You don't need those big long ones. They, I've never had a problem with these. These, these are really easy to deal with. Um, when you do it, you can hear the different sounds as it goes in when it gets uh, bottomed out. You simply cut it off, and, and this is kind of the way we do it. We always close the posterior portal uh, 
it was already said before because of, it's a stress riser, and so the patients that were sent to me from before uh, the revisions, I always, uh, I always look back there and I can see the hole where the, where, where the old portal site used to be. So that's what forced me to close all the posterior portals. Um, uh, Time-wise, it's much shorter. So using knotless fixation is definitely improves your, 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 your the use of your OR. So your options are you can do a labor repair only in throwers. You can do a debridement in some throwers with a flap tear, which is a whole different topic. You can do a capsule labor repair and shift. You can do a capsule uh, I'm not a big fan of rotator interval closures. I'll talk to you. But I, I will tell you that electrothermals you want to stay away from. Uh, Don D'Alessandro and I presented our, our, our article with 100% follow-up of 84 patients. And in five years, we had a 40% failure rate. So I think you ought to stay away from that. Um, so... I'm trying to make a case for arthroscopic here. So in 2005, that was our first prospective study of 100. We had 91 good to excellent results with the ASES score, which is a generous score now. And we had 86 return to the sport, which is pretty good, 86%. Our, our 200, uh, we just published in 2013. Uh, this, these are the two things you should take home from this. The suture anchor group in the 200. We have 400 now, but only, only 200 met the criteria when we wrote the paper. Uh, the suture anchor group that we used had a definitely uh, significantly higher ASES score and return to sport were both significant, so um, probably a good idea. So in the literature, if you look at arthroscopic versus open, recurrence instability, open procedures is 12%. Arthroscopic is 5%. So it wins the gold medal in, in recurrent instability, ability to address concomitant pathology, perioperative morbidity, return to sport, and cosmesis. The eighth thing I learned is that rotator interval rarely needs to be closed. So my first 100, I, uh, I did seven rotator interval closures, and they were probably MDIs, and I missed them. They were probably posterior inferiors, and, and I just missed them. The second 200, I did none. I did none. And, and actually, the second 200 are actually better than the first. Matt Preventure, you all know Matt. Matt did a, a wonderful article that really saved me from doing that because in his study, it showed clearly that if you, do it anti, if you do a rotator interval closure, it significantly reduces, decreases your uh, external rotation by 39%. It did nothing to the posterior uh, stability. So he said this study calls in, uh, to question the need for arthroscopic rotator interval closure in the setting of posterior instability. I will tell you, you do not need to do it. The ninth thing I learned is when in doubt, use suture anchors. So of my contact athletes, just as my first 100, we had four out of five of the contact athletes fail without suture anchors. In my overhead athletes, uh, in the same group, we had three out of three, and the next study was just the same. So I've, I've gone away, I use suture anchors. Tenth thing is you really don't have to change your therapist. You're only really as good as your physical therapist. You don't have to change it, but, but therapists are really important in this, so you gotta find the right ones. So my indications for surgery right now are failed rehab greater than six months, a large labor or, large labor or flap tear on the MRI if it's flapping around like a meniscus, if they have glenoid bone loss greater than five millimeters, uh, I think there's a little predisposition they don't have their literature. Uh, reverse haggle lesions and the inability to return to the sport at the same level. So these are the questions I get asked. These are only my opinion. Uh, but when to anchor, when in doubt, when to plicate, it depends on the sport. Football very aggressively. Throwers rarely do I plicate. When to debride, sometimes you'll get these large flap tears back there. Look like a big meniscus floating around. You just need to cut them off in throwers, and then you look at the junction. If the junction looks pretty good, you don't have to do much of anything. If there's a Kim lesion underneath, you need to know what a Kim lesion is. They're these kind of hidden lesions that are down low. You see them on the MRIs. If there's that, you have to unroof that and sew that down. The hardest one is when to fix a labrum and release the posterior capsule. Which kind of, you're going, what are you talking about? Well, there are cases when you have recalcitrant internal impingement or internal rotation deficits where you literally have to fix the labrum and then release the posterior band of the anterior inferior glenohumeral ligament to get their, in, uh, get their internal rotation. That's a whole hour-long lecture on that, on what to do, when to do it. It's, it's a hard thing, but you want to think about it. Um, when to close the rotator interval, I close the rotator uh, uh, interval never. Only in true MDIs if, if I think it's, it's, it's important and, and they're not stable enough. Thank you very much.